Tuesday, October 22nd. I'm Paul Joseph Watson. This is InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, 47 million food stamp recipients to have their benefits cut back on November 1st, while DHS spends 80 million in tax dollars to quell civil disturbance. Plus, Alex Jones and Anthony Gucciardi reason with the San Antonio police chief at the Alamo over gun control. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Top story tonight, Interpol chief arms citizens globally to prevent terror attacks. Interpol Secretary General Ronald Noble told ABC News that one of the only ways to prevent terrorists from hitting soft targets was to arm citizens globally, noting that the Westgate Mall siege would have been averted far quicker if it had taken place in gun-friendly areas like Denver or Texas. Noble's statements are a powerful rebuttal to the anti-gun lobby, especially given his background. The Interpol chief was formerly head of all law enforcement for the U.S. Treasury Department. And as we saw with the mall siege in Kenya, it was ex-SAS soldiers and others armed with handguns who helped rescue the hostages, who couldn't defend themselves because they live in a country where, aside from the government, only criminals and terrorists are able to access guns. So the head of Interpol is now saying that it's time to arm the people to prevent bloodbaths like the Westgate Mall siege. This is the head of the second largest global intergovernmental organization after the United Nations. This is a big, big deal. And his views are backed up by hard statistics. Studies which are linked in this InfoWars article illustrate how Americans use guns some 2.5 million times a year to protect themselves during confrontations with criminals. Justice Department figures also show that violent crimes have decreased as gun ownership has increased. And it's a brave stand from an extremely prominent individual, and we can expect the backlash from the gun control lobby to be imminent. Homeland Security spends $80 million on armed guards for civil disturbances. The DHS is set to spend, spend $80 million on hiring a raft of armed guards to protect IRS and other government buildings in upstate New York during, quote, public demonstrations and civil disturbances. So again, they're talking about preparing for domestic disorder. And we know for a fact that the federal agency is preparing for civil unrest because back in June, the DHS was busy purchasing body armor and helmets for what they said were riot control situations. That's a direct quote. So we're not saying that Homeland Security is gearing up for riots. They are. And what form could such domestic disorder take? Well, last year, FPS agents, which is a unit of the DHS, ran a drill entitled Operation Shield, during which FPS armed FPS agents with semi-automatic guns were stationed outside a social security office in Florida. So are they preparing for an anti-IRS backlash, potentially in relation to Obamacare? Or are they possibly gearing up for what happens when benefits get cut or ultimately withdrawn altogether? Which leads us into our next story, EBT looters to be shamed online. Looters who took advantage of last weekend's EBT card system failure to steal Walmart groceries are to be shamed into admitting guilt by having their photos posted online. And the police there in many, which is in Louisiana, are resorting to this measure to try and catch the culprits. Of course, this is in response to the crash of the electronic benefits transfer system last weekend, which prompted shoppers in several Walmarts to leave the store with goods they hadn't paid for in addition to others who staged mini riots when the system went down. So if a, downtown, if a downtime of merely hours in this case causes mini riots, how about a massive cut in benefits for millions of Americans? That's the subject of Michael Snyder's article today entitled 47 million food stamp recipients are having their benefits cut on November 1st. 47.6 million Americans are about to have their food stamp benefits cut, and most of them have absolutely no idea that it is about to happen. And this is basically a, re a recession-era boost in benefits that took place back in spring. It's now set to end. 
there's going to be a $36 per family cut in food stamp benefits. And considering that the current average monthly food stamp income is just $272 per household, that's a huge amount for those living on the poverty line. So are we going to see shelves stripped bare in areas like we did in the aftermath of the EBT card crash? does appear to be a very possible outcome. And again, it all goes back to dependency, dependency on government when the rug is pulled out from underneath people's feet. There's no real safety net, and this is what they have to resort to. So the question is, those people who are suffering most from this, those on the poverty line, set to get their benefits cut once again. Are we going to see riots? Are we going to see unrest like we did on a smaller scale last weekend with the EBT card system failure? National News reports mysterious phone calls from 865-6696 may install NSA surveillance code on your iPhone. All across America, people who have Sprint service on their iPhones and other mobile devices are receiving repeated calls from the number 865-6696 without any area code. Sprint message boards are full of thousands of complaints of people experiencing this issue, but no one seems to understand the true reason why these calls are being made. So Mike Adams talked to a cybersecurity expert who told him that this was actually an NSA Trojan horse, which works by downloading a data packet onto your phone in seconds when you answer the call. According to the expert, this is being targeted at people with older iPhone 4s because the snooping technology already installed on their devices is in need of an upgrade. Adams writes, when I asked my contact why this would be happening, he answered that in his belief, the program was a test rollout on the Sprint network only, and that testing was being done to establish human behavior patterns, uh, as well as answer rates, hold times, and payload install time requirements. This information could then be used to determine whether a more expanded rollout across other phone networks would make sense. So the takeaway here is whatever the true purpose behind this, if you get a call from 865-6696, don't answer it. It could be the NSA downloading a Trojan packet onto your phone. Finally tonight, petition launch demanding White House open source disastrous healthcare.gov code. A petition has been launched on the White House website demanding that the Obama administration release the defective code for healthcare.gov website to the open source community, a move that would make public the errors that have led to such a disastrous rollout. The petition submitted via the We The People website states, release to the open source community the source code to healthcare.gov, specifically all code written by CGI Federal. So $634 million was spent on developing this train wreck. And as Ted Cruz joked today, you know, it looks more like it was put together by Nigerian email scammers than technology experts, which is why the government has now desperately reached out to the private sector in an attempt to fix it. Too little, too late, once again. So we've asked the question before, as have other experts, was this designed to fail all along in order to avoid the shock of millions of Americans suddenly finding out that their costs under Obamacare were soaring, average 99% for men, 62% for women? Did they want them to boil in the pot like the frog of gradualism rather than get that instant shock? That's what a lot of, a lot of experts are saying were behind this. Of course, it's well documented that the White House knew that there would be problems. The site wasn't ready before it was launched. And this petition seeks to find out more. Of course, it needs 100,000 signatures before November 19th in order to reach the threshold which mandates a White House response. That's it for the news. Stick around after the break. We've got more special reports coming up, but also stay tuned after the 30-minute show because we got some bonus material. Gigi Onetta sits down for an interview with Israeli-American filmmaker Bama Naziri. Why is nascent iodine so important? Nascent iodine is so important because it goes directly to the thyroid. It's not bonded to a salt, which means it doesn't have to be broken down. 
and it's the most usable form. It's what the body uses. It's what the body is designed to use. If you have low energy levels, if you have pains, if you have thyroid problems, if you don't feel up to par, well, they've proven now that the fluoride and a lack of iodine causes a decreased IQ because you have all this stuff that builds up inside your system and builds up and builds up. And that's why some people, when they start taking iodine, will have what's called a Hertzheimer reaction or a detoxification reaction. But that's a good sign. That means you're detoxifying all that fluoride buildup, the mercury buildup in there, the bromine buildup in your system, and the chlorine buildup in your system. You don't want those things. All of those things have been proven as carcinogens. That's one of the reasons prostate cancer is on the rise, too, is because prostate takes up iodine and the men that are lacking iodine causes the prostate to become cystic and causes the prostate to swell and eventually leads to prostate cancer. There's been an extreme rise in polycystic ovarian disease, PCOS with women, fibrocystic breast disease because iodine is stored in the breast tissue, the ovaries, the prostate glands in men. It's utilized by every single cell in the body. Mm, why does this almost taste good compared to other iodine that tastes horrible? That's because it's real iodine atomic form. We wanted something that's going to go straight into the bloodstream and straight into the thyroid gland. We wanted to put it in a vegetable glycerin base. That's a USP kosher certified vegetable glycerin base. And that product is not tested on animals. It's vegan friendly. It's gluten free. It's GMO free. Of all the things I've done, nascent iodine was just absolutely amazing so we developed with dr group a double strength low price infowarslife.com survival shield the atomic nation iodine available right now this past weekend alex jones and anthony gucciotti confronted the san antonio police chief at the alamo event let's see what happened hey you're out here chief how's it going what's happening dude alex jones hey alex did you uh, join the speeches and stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I hope they get rid of that unconstitutional city ordinance. What do you say? Well, we'll see what happens. I had a question for you. We ended up speaking to an officer who told us that, yeah, we're just filming you guys up at that building over there, which you could clearly see officers filming us. He, they said, yeah, we're just filming you because it's a large gathering. You said it's about large gatherings. There's been plenty of large gatherings before that's not been filmed. You're filming it. Just, just tell me the truth. You're filming it because it's a Second Amendment rally. I'm filming it because I'm worried about any repercussions if something <laughs> evil or nefarious or bad were to happen. I'm not questioning it. I'm wondering what the intel is on to, as to why they have to film us all. We don't, we don't put our intel out there. Here's my issue. The police support the Second Amendment, which most of them do. We like them. Overall, they're good. We're glad this is going off as a good event. Separately, like when the police last time sent me the terror attack on Austin a few months ago that was imminent, uh, from the Department of Defense, and then it turned out it was fake. The feds were just scaremongering people, and the police still have to respond to those threats, even if they're fake. The, but that's how Homeland Security creates the fear to then justify things. But separately, with all the people on Prozac-type drugs, in a city of millions of people, there are unstable folks. I'm happy the police are armed, and I'm happy we're armed. What do you think, Chief, about the Second Amendment? I think that all the amendments, uh, people have the right to exercise their constitutional rights. Would you confiscate guns if given federal orders to do so? Uh, you're asking me hypotheticals. Yes, that's not going right. there. Hypothetical. Would you? Uh, again, I, I can't uh, even begin to guess what I would do as far as the hypo hypothetical situation you're speaking of. I haven't been given an order like that. So. But they did it in New Orleans. They went to the high and dry areas and took the guns. And then a federal law had to be written saying that was illegal. It was already a law. But, you know, uh, what's that, the Hatch Act? My question is if Obama said that the Second Amendment is now invalid and all officers must go door to door and confiscate their weapons. Obama said that, or our Lord and Savior said that to us. Would you do or that? Hitler, I mean, what, what would you think about that, uh, personally? You're asking, you're asking hypothetical. Well, I mean, the police are no, 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 no. You're sworn to uphold the Constitution. the Constitution. So that's what so you, you do. So you would say no to confiscating guns from the general public. I mean, it would be illegal for Obama to do that. It would be against the Constitution. If which Santa Ana was our president again, and he said, go confiscate the guns, would you do it? I'm not trying to man. No, you would obey it. You're not going to get promoted up to the Justice Department if you answer this right. <laughs> say, say, I will take the guns from the American scum, and you could probably become the head of Homeland Security. I will take them from your cold say, I will say that. Just say, just, just say, yeah, just say, I'm coming for you, American scum. We're going to get your guns. <laughs> if you say that, you're going to the top. DHS. White House. You'll be like Arde Saveda. You'll be up there with Obama. You'll be powerful.
Just do it. Just say, I hate American scum. We'll get your guns, <laughs> and you'll be working for the feds making 400 grand a year. And there'll be drug money on the side. You know, they all run those. I don't think you would do it. I don't know about you. What, what do you say? Would you disarm the public if Obama, your lord and savior, told you to do so? It's a hypothetical question. Yes, it is. It is hypothetical. It's oh, wait, illegal. your oath is not hypothetical? Couldn't even begin to guess. Well, did you but take an oath to the Constitution? Couldn't even begin to guess. You don't know if you took an oath to the Constitution? Oh, I took an oath. And is the Second Amendment in the Constitution? Sure. It still is, right? Mm -hmm. So but Bloomberg you, says that means you have a right to turn them in. Yeah, so this... Like, well, we have rights in this phantom zone, like, you know. So, so I guess by taking an oath to the Constitution, which the Second Amendment, to my knowledge, as far as I'm concerned, is still in the Constitution. So by taking guns from people, that's going against the Constitution. So by saying that you may do so, Obama is now above the Constitution. Is that true? I never said I may do so, sir. I stand by. It's a hypothetical. Oath. Is Kim Jong Un supreme? Look, let me just let me, just, let me stop. Just, sure. I'm not here to debate with you guys. Well, I'm not here to debate with you either. Asking a very simple question. Every single officer, by the way, I've asked this to. They always say no right away. Hey, There's listen. no other thing. They have put up with record amounts of pestering, though. Yeah, I understand that you don't want to pledge to Obama. It's okay. It's, everything's good. Stay tuned because after the break, we'll see what happened when Alex Jones spent time with security guru John McAfee. That's coming up next on InfoWars Nightly News. Many anthropologists and archaeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is, taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest times. We also have starter varieties of the deluxe seed packages for fruit, salads, salsa, peppers, medical herbs, and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. Introducing Pro One, all of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gate, we have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. Well, folks, we're driving along to the Texas Hill Country with John McAfee, the legendary uh, tech guru and inventor of antivirus software. He's here in Austin visiting with us, and he was just noticing when he checked uh, Yahoo's front page that the two top stories are about him refusing to help the uh, government try to fix Obamacare, and then another one about how he's been voted the top pick to head up uh, Microsoft, and I like what he was reading, so read it for the folks out there, sir. All right. The company doesn't need some corporate fat cat to lead it into its last battles. It needs a leader with charisma and excitement. Someone who may be prepared to do the unexpected thing. Is this too much to ask from a firm at the forefront of an industry that's fundamentally not yet even middle-aged? Microsoft's other enemy, Google, will be shown up by a switched-on, slightly dangerous, newer Microsoft CEO. After all, where McAfee seems pretty open about his hedonistic excesses, Google chairman Eric Schmidt seems bland, while it seems he enjoys his own hedonistic exercises in private. Who do you trust? The person who is honest about what he does, or the one who keeps it quiet while telling others that privacy doesn't exist anymore? 
There were some change their spots. I suppose McAfee would quickly find himself moving between controversies. That's great. He'd be the talk of the town and would have the opportunity to indulge himself in many different ways. He could bring danger and excitement, scandal and a sense of unpredictability. Microsoft would seem exciting and interesting, and the world's press would reel in manufactured shock and awe as the maverick Microsoft McAfee threatened to turn the world upside down. This personal excitement would make Apple seem uptight and Google seem dishonest in comparison. And that's from Computer World. That's from Computer World. Well, that's a smart article. And, you know, when you first read the headline, I said, I bet that's serious because people like a rebel. They like an innovator. They like somebody who's a winner. And uh, you, you just won in a million, got out of that whole setup down there in Belize. And then you read the article. That's basically what it said. It is. And, and again, I've, I've been in this industry since the very beginning. I mean, I, I, when computers were the size of, of small cities, uh, I was programming. And I've managed pro uh, programming jobs for... Uh, all of my life. So it's not like I don't know the industry, and I, I certainly uh, have success in building large companies from nothing. That's right. Uh, MSNBC was trying to make fun of it at first, but then said, actually, your points were good. Like, he's a guy that was accused of something, but actually was innocent. Uh, but, you know, now the, the uh, Congress is calling him for help. Well, they better be calling somebody for help. Yeah, that's the problem. They're, they're calling for help, but they don't really want to listen to advice. They they know what they're going to do. You said they, scrap it, right? I said scrap it because it's never going to work the way it's built. So we have to throw it away and start over. And that's what I said, but no, they don't want to hear that. And I could tell them how to start over to make it very cheap and very quick. And then MSNBC, they're total handmaidens for Obama. I mean, you just as a you know, internet technology person, you told them what you thought, and they had to make it political of course. because the emperor has beautiful new clothes on. Absolutely. Um, and again, I don't mind to see CNBC's political stance. I mean, as long as they will listen to me and, and won't twist my words, you know, and uh, since much of it was written down, they couldn't twist That's it. That's right. It was CNBC, not MSNBC. C right. But, see, but even CNBC has their own political bias, of course. Uh, but in any case, I don't care what their bias is. Just give me a chance to say something and, and make up your own mind. I agree. Well, uh, you know, exciting that... Uh, Obamacare is being exposed as a fraud. It always was. I read the legislation or scanned over it. It was it's a total special interest deal to jack up health care prices and make people buy it. I mean, in a controlled market like that, the price is going to go up, the quality is going to go down. It always does. Doesn't it? That's what happens when you try to control uh, you know, free enterprise. The reason it's called free enterprise is because it's free. You get to choose and, and, and make your own path. True individuality, individuals right. deciding what they're going to purchase, right. voting right. with their dollars. Absolutely. In closing, we're going shooting. You looking forward to shooting the 50 cal? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite weapons, and I'd like to shoot my own handgun. I haven't actually exercised it in quite a while, so I'm, I'm looking forward well, to it. Well, we're about to do some shooting, and uh, I hope you brought plenty of 357 ammo. I think we may have brought some, but uh, we'll see what happens. Well, you have the 357. I've used, I'm, I'm doing a 38 special today. 38 special, that's right. <laughs> the problem I got here is it's been a long time since I've shot a, uh, a 50 caliber, and I'm sure that I'm not as good as I used to be. So if you don't mind, I'm going to imagine my target out there, and I'll tell you whether or not I hit it in the center, okay? Okay. You don't have a problem with that. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, perfect. Just like Obamacare. Well, we don't have, we don't have very good targets out there, so we can... You can just imagine them, I guess. Yes. The, the, it's a, the Obamacare is the same thing, you know, right? They, they've imagined the uh, the rollout as being successful, and therefore it, they've met their, their expectations. That's and right. I'm sure I every shot... I want to do the shot... same thing with my target. I, I've, I'll hit it point blank every time. I'm sure every I shot is going to be a success. It's perfect. That's perfect. right. Well, Shane, we just did a lot of shooting. What was your favorite part of all the different guns we shot on the upcoming Brothers in Arms? Well, it was actually it was watching John shoot the, uh, the 50 cal. It was pretty amazing, especially the fact that you were left-handed, or you, you're right-handed and you shoot left-handed. That's pretty amazing. You were doing pretty good for, for having that handicap. Well, I was amazed I could even lift it. You know? <laughs> it weighs more than my wife. So, yeah, I had a blast. I really did. We did a great job. Thank you, sir. The last time I talked to you, you were hiding out somewhere in the Belizean jungle and you made it out. I tell you, uh, I saw that article, like, America loves the success, the success story of an adventure. That they do. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I was fortunate. I had, I had good help and I uh, I was careful. I kept my head low, and for a month and a half, I evaded the 7,000-man uh, army. All of them had my photograph looking for me, and 4,000 police, and managed to get across the border carrying, uh, you know, two reporters and a retinue of young girls. So I, I think that was success. How did you do it? Uh, you know, mostly by misdirection. You know, the uh, uh, telling friends that I knew were unfaithful friends that I was in one place when I wasn't, and they would then tell the government, and they would all rush there, and I'd be somewhere else. 
Uh, and I got across the border because the, um, uh, the southern border was completely uh, manned with guards. Uh, I managed to arrange to get arrested in Mexico. It was a double that looked like me. Uh, and, uh, and had that reported in, in the international press. And everybody went north to the Mexican border. And I just waltzed across the southern border into Guatemala. You sound like a James Bond character. We're hanging out with James Bond right now. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, well, at the time it was a little bit spooky, but uh, I, I knew I could do it. I also chose a day that it was raining. And uh, in Belize, no police officer gets out of their car in the rain to check another car. This is a fact. So I chose a rainy day, and we drove uh, 200 miles down the southern highway and passed a bunch of checkpoints. And the police were all huddled in their cars looking out the window, and, and no one stopped us. No one, no one did anything. I was reading Computer World today. They had a big vote, and you're the most popular person. They said to head up Microsoft. You know, that surprised me, actually. They, uh, it was... Um, I think Tech Week that did the survey of 10, 10 or 20,000 users, and they all voted, and I was number one. I have 27% for me, 24 for Bill Gates, and the other 30 uh, people only got less than 10% of the vote. So uh, I, I don't know whether the world has gone crazy or what, but I wouldn't take that job. It's too boring. I almost forgot the whole reason I was doing this quick interview is I asked if you're going to be writing a book anytime soon. I saw on the news that there's two major movie companies uh, Warner Brothers and somebody else, I forget, that are already making a movie about uh, your great escape down there from the clutches of the third world dictators. That's true. Warner Brothers uh, has already announced the screenwriters, and uh, then Impact Future Media in Canada is, is doing their own movie, and, and that script has already been written. Um, I think the Warner Brothers movie is based on uh, a book by Josh Davis, who claims that he lived with me for most of a year. He actually spent just a few hours with me in Belize and then went back and uh, pretended to be the McAfee expert. So... Uh, I'm anxious for both of them to come out. I'd like to see what, what I actually did. So, But then someday there'll be the real movie put out with what you really did do. Yeah, I hope so. Real soon. All right, John McAfee, thanks for talking to us. And folks, can you check out your website? Give them the address. It's uh, whoismcafee.com, whoismcafee.com. And we're at Infowars.com out here with Shane Stanner on his beautiful ranch doing some shooting. Shane, thanks as always. Had fun. Yeah. All right, Alex Thank Jones you, signing off. Hey. Awesome. All Let's right. For Infowars.com. Thank you, Alex. John McAfee and the 50 caliber shootout coming to InfoWars Nightly News, Wednesday, October 23rd. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. I'm Jakari Jackson with an Infowars Nightly News Alert. Are you willing to fire upon Americans? That's the question reportedly being asked of military personnel. And who's asking this question? The United States government themselves, according to the military personnel we've talked to. Retired Navy SEAL Benjamin Smith went on the Fox News channel, revealing how he believes the United States government is trying to provoke veterans into an armed confrontation. He was also on the Alex Jones radio show today, telling us about the litmus test he was given. Going back to the... the the beginning of this administration, there were I've I've had friends within the community talking about how they were brought in and you know questioned with people from um, you know more towards the top side, and the questioning resulted in kind of where the where it was pointing was you know. Do you feel comfortable disarming American citizens? And you can see that now with the shutting of a lot of the officers and stuff like that. It's, it's you know, we don't have the 100% track on it, but, you know, there, there's a lot of funny things happening within 
military. That's now, to now that's bombshell, but I want to quantify that. I have Secret mm -hmm. Service, FBI sources on record on the air, but also covert sources that are currently in. They say exactly that for two years. There is a litmus test where officers from the generals down to lieutenant generals, down to majors, down to sergeant, uh, you know, master sergeants, will you fire on U.S. citizens? And if you say no, you're sent to the worst hellhole or basically kicked out. If you say yes, you're put into special homeland security units. Quantify, you're saying yep. people in the community, special warfare community, are saying they have been brought into litmus test meetings. Yeah. And at this at this moment in this conversation, it's... Yeah, uh, God, I, to bring it back to Van Jones. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, like, do you remember him when he said you have to, like, for us to have the argument or to just have the conversation logically, and what he was saying with, like, the communists and the lefties and the, everything that he, Van Jones is, it's you drop the radical pose for the radical ends. And just to translate that into what this is, you know, I understand a lot of libertarian Ron Paul, a lot of people that that are your listeners um, get like fervent and very strong about it. And it's not about, you know, being the person that's the loudest right there, having that logical conversation to where someone else can reply and you can go back with facts. And it's it's a logical conversation that needs to be had. And you can see the rest of that bombshell interview on prisonplanet.tv, where if you're not a member, you need to join today. You get a 15-day free trial, and you can also share one username and passcode with up to 11 different people. Get your membership today. Now stick around, because after this, we'll have more special reports. I'm Jakari Jackson, and this has been an InfoWars Nightly News Alert. With me is Bachman Nasiri as he's going to take us behind the curtain to see the Golden Veil. Bachman, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me, Gigi, and for giving me eight minutes of your news broadcast. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask Alex Jones to give me seven minutes of his show so I have my 15 minutes of fame. But I'm bummed. You're very good at math. <laughs> <laughs> Gigi, uh, would you like to know why I'm wearing an orange T-shirt? Yes, I would. Because after this show, I'll be taken away to play basketball for 30 years. <laughs> uh, but um, um, gosh, I hope not. You know, I want to, our viewers to know more about your story. So let's get started and, and we'll talk about The Golden Veil, the movie that you made. But let's talk a little bit about Bauman. Right. Um, I'm an Iranian exile uh, turned into an Iranian-American filmmaker. I am also a 32nd degree Mason trying to reveal the truth. But if I start talking, Gigi, I'll have to speak for two or three hours. So I'll leave that uh, for a face-to-face -face debate with Alex Jones. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> To learn, to learn more about me, viewers should type my name in YouTube search box and click on the yellow rows where they will find uh, my recent interviews. Also, follow me on Twitter at Bahman Nasiri. Okay. So, Bahman Nasiri at, at Twitter. And we'll, we'll put that up on the screen for the viewers, too. Let's talk about, let's jump right in and talk about the skull and bones issue. The skull and bones, uh, wow. Um, uh, you mean the skull and bones uh, relationship with uh, the Roshanaya, where uh, I, I have shown that in my feature film, The Golden Veil, and also I've talked about that in a number of interviews. Well, I'll try to explain this um, um, quickly. Uh, okay. What do you see here, Gigi? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's a pyramid. With it's a, a pyramid. Mm -hmm, with a ring in okay. it. <laughs> Seven billion people lie at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. The main part of the pyramid is occupied by Freemasons. 
Freemasons who know nothing about what is at the top, where you will see the all-seeing eye. If you turn a, a dollar banknote, you will see that. Okay. The all-seeing eye, the, a small portion of the pyramid at the top is occupied by a secret society that I have explained in my interviews. They are called the eagles. Now, between the section occupied by the Freemasons and the eagles, there is a section where the skull and bones and the Roshanaya occupy. Now, you know what important figures are members of the skull and bones. So let me now explain about the Roshanaya. The Roshanaya goes back to the 16th century and it started in the mountains of Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden was a member of the Roshanaya at the age of 21. It was later on that he formed his own group called uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, and he actually participated um, in kicking Russians out of Afghanistan. Now, uh, you may already try, uh, be trying to connect the dots. Uh, the Roshanaya is considered as a sister branch of the Skull and Bones. Okay. So now, uh, this will make it interesting, interesting for you. Uh, and for those who believe that 9-11 was a conspiracy uh, because if George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, etc., they are members of the Skull and Bones, and Osama bin Laden was a member of the Roshanaya, although he would never have admitted to it, um, then there is a connection there. You agree? Yes, I do agree. And I always wondered why there was some kind of communication between the Bushes and that side. I just I didn't understand it. So please continue. Yes. You will you will notice in my interviews uh, that I explain what I know about the secret plans to begin World War Three. Plus more. Um, and I state uh, my case why it is so wrong for the Obama administration to begin dialogue with the Islamic Republic of Iran. We are at a crucial point in the history of mankind. And if we fail in stopping the demons from carrying out their agenda, billions of people will be dead as a result of a world war, which will begin with Muslims and Jews wiping each other out. And get a little bit clearer on the actual demons. Talk about that. The demons are the lodge of the eagles, that the Freemasons are not aware of it. And I have to go into detail about all this. It will um, uh, take me a long time. You know, we don't, I realize we do not have that much time on this news broadcast. But um, in my film, the, uh, well, Gigi, I, I'm not here to advertise uh, for my feature film called The Golden Veil, but in this film, I showed the conspiracy behind the Iranian revolution and the U.S. hostage crisis of 1979, connecting to what is happening today. The Iranian revolution was a conspiracy as the first step of the, of the final chapter of the New World Order. And what we are going to see over the next couple of years is other is, uh, Islamic countries in the Middle East turning into Islamic fundamentalists uh, one by one, as we have already seen happening. And I predicted this in 2011 during an MIT debate. Um, why? Because the big plan is to turn 
the whole of the Middle East into a big enemy against the United States and Israel to stage a big war. And behind the scenes, they will be encouraging Iran to manufacture its nuclear heads. Because to, to make big war, you need big enemy. You wouldn't want a war that would be over in two or three days, like the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. So therefore, I do not believe all this um, love affair, I call it, between President Obama and the new Iranian President Rouhani. Uh, this is uh, all a show. Mm -hmm. um, behind the scenes, they will encourage Iran, they will support Iran behind the scenes to develop its nuclear heads, and that has to be stopped. Wow. And so how do the Chinese and North Korea and all the other uh, big players figure into this? Well, you know, uh, the war will begin between Muslims and Jews. And that is how it's, it is going to begin. And I hope that it doesn't spread. But obviously, if you're talking of World War III, they are all going to get involved. Um, the demons, uh, the demons, as you call them, they, their big plan is to reduce world population. Before World War III, there were three billion people on Earth, and they, they uh, used to say that uh, the world is overpopulated. Now we, are, we have seven billion, and natural resources on the decline. Um, uh, and the only way to reduce world population is through atomic wars. I know this sounds uh, frightening, but... We are heading that way. And it is up to us, 7 billion people on Earth, to stop those demons who are less than 1,000 people uh, who are ruling upon us. And what do you see being the next wave that will help stop that? What do you believe will be the next thing that will stand against the demons? By pe people to be enlightened, to know of these um, plans which were drawn decades ago behind closed doors. It all began with the Iranian revolution 34 years ago. Uh, but as I have uh, gone into more detail in my other interviews, especially the Hagman and Hagman report, um, in that interview that took about two hours, I explained in detail where it, when it actually originated. And uh, we would be going back um, uh, to the time, uh, to the 19th century, uh, when Albert Pike wrote a letter to, the, to an Italian revolutionary by the name of Mazzini. And in that letter, he predicted World War I, World War II, and World War Three. And according to his writings, and that letter was displayed in the London Museum for a while before it was taken away. Um, and in that letter, he explained um, uh, how a uh, Third World War would begin between the Arabs and the Jews. And what will the Jewish people be doing? How, what is their next move in the prophecy, So, if that's what you want to call what he wrote? What would be the next thing? Are they going to stand up against, or is it going to be induced by the United States of America? What do you see? Well, uh, the only thing that uh, Israel can do is to, and I'm an Iranian saying this, and I, I will, uh, once this program is aired, uh, I will probably be the most unpopular Iranian uh, in the <laughs> world by saying this. But the only thing Israel can do to defend itself, to prevent uh, another Holocaust, is to bomb Iran's nuclear installations. Uh, that will put them back probably 20 years. 
and that will give us time to overthrow that regime and and bring back our friendship with Israel. Iran and Israel were good friends for decades. Um, Jewish people um, uh, were in Iran or the old Persia since the time of King Cyrus, who gave them their freedom. And that all ended with the Islamic Revolution of 1979. So you're not actually calling for action, though, against them. You're, you're saying we can settle this in a peaceful way by disarming them, right? Uh, it will never be peaceful. Um, <laughs> well, they are, are obviously not going to say, hey, here, take my nukes, right? <laughs> no, they are not going to. They have one aim. The Islamic Republic of Iran has one aim, and that is to manufacture its nuclear heads and attack Israel because they are looking forward to Armageddon. Well, here at InfoWars, we don't act, you know, we're not going to say go to war. That's just not something that we're going to, we're going to say. I see your perspective on it, but we're not going to condone um, a war. We can only pray that they will do the right thing. And, um, and with that being said, I understand that you've had some changes in your personal life as well. Well, sure. Um, well, I will be glad to tell you that five months ago, I turned Christian. And I have to say amen to that. And I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to hear your testimony. It's on YouTube and it's very powerful to watch. Mm -hmm. And that turned my life around. I finally realized that uh, I had lived in darkness for 60 years of my life until I turned Christian. Well, our God is greater than any of those demons. And what we can hope for is that there will be some massive divine intervention that will disarm Iran. <laughs> uh, well, um, to, to prevent war, there is a way. And that is for the Iranian populace to rise up and topple that regime by themselves. Amen. 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 It has been really great talking with you, Bauman. Gigi, <laughs> uh, I would like to congratulate you for your great performance in your movie, Flag of My Father. Thank you, sir. Duly noted and received. <laughs> and <laughs> give, us, give us your Twitter page again so that people can, can communicate with you. Uh, at Bahman Nasiri. And uh, Gigi, if I have a few more minutes, um, I would like to um, salute Alex Jones with a message, if I may. Go right ahead. Gigi, do you see this? this is, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. This is a 357 Magnum. Yes. <laughs> and this is the gun that saved my father's life at his resi residence in L.A. in 1983 when Ayatollah Khomeini sent his little boys to assassinate him. Wow. Those who favor gun control shall regret it when their homes are invaded by terrorists, thieves, rapists, or psychopaths. But let me tell you that you cannot defend your family with a handgun. That's why I believe every family should own a long rifle. You know, the only reason those scumbag terrorists do not dare coming after me is because they know I'm fully armed with an AK-47 and an AR-15 and a thousand rounds of ammunition. Alex, if we had a thousand men like you, today a gang of less than a thousand criminals would not have been ruling upon seven billion people on earth. So I'd like to be one of your comrades. You need an Iranian freedom fighter amongst your team. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And of course, that was Bama Nasiri and here at InfoWars, we obviously don't want to encourage war, but there is an info war out there that we need to do battle in. And in that info war, 
I suggest that you reach out to people and tell them about PrisonPlanet.tv. You can give your username and password to up to 10 people, and let them know about Alex Jones and the war that's on for your mind. I'm Gigi Arnetta for the InfoWars Nightly News. It's real simple. Uh, not only uh, we have, I see some come and take it flags, it's also interesting that the first battle of the Texas Revolution was in Gonzales when the uh, Mexican army uh, went to Gonzales to take the cannon away uh, from the settlers who lived there. And they said no. They said come and take it. The Mexican army was unsuccessful in doing that. And then some of those men who were at that battle were also among the Immortal 32 that rode to Alamo. They came here to reinforce the garrison, and they died here. So some of those who were involved in that come and take it fight also gave the ultimate price for liberty. The Second Amendment, in my view, is the defender of the rest. And, and you also have to go back to the founders and, and what they wrote, what, what they said, what they meant. They were very careful when they wrote our Bill of Rights to emphasize that these rights were not granted by government. That these are God-given natural rights. And that they merely enumerated those rights, the first, the second, the fourth, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, all of those, they merely enumerated those rights. Because if you accept the premise that government can give you rights, you must also accept the premise that that same government can take them away. So it's not, about, it's not about defending the actions of man and our founders. It's about defending the liberty that we enjoy by virtue of being born free men and free women. 